Hi everybody, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today we're still going to be looking at uh, macroeconomic theory and we're going to be taking a look at inflation. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with inflation, it gets reported in the news quite a bit and we hear certain numbers coming out of the uh, Reserve Bank and all that. But in short, inflation simply is prices going up over time. You can also have deflation where prices are going down, but generally prices tend to go up over time. And depending on what country you're in, um, it can go up by different amounts. Like for example, in Australia, the um, inflation rate is typically fairly low, somewhere between about one and about three, maybe at the most four percent. There's other countries where inflation is significantly higher, and that's where it becomes more of a problem. So low inflation generally isn't considered too much of a problem. It still, in some ways, can be uh, have negative effects of it as well. Some argue that a little bit of inflation could also be good. So what I'm going to be covering off on today is what are the causes of inflation and also what is the potential harm of having inflation. So mostly going to be focusing on the causes. So how do you measure inflation? So generally you just hear indicators such as the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and you also probably hear the PPI, Producer Price Index. So the CPI it relates to your final goods, your final products. So that looks at how much your your daily things have increased, like for example, you know, how much has your bread gone up, how much has milk gone up, how much as some of the other things that you buy, like maybe your washing machine or your refrigerators and things like that. So it's looking at end products, whereas your producer price index, that focuses more on the cost of firms and organizations of actually um, building things or generating things and, and that again that can be broken down into many categories so can the cpi as well but producer ice price index affects basically production costs as you can see from the graph here there's actually quite a correlation so if there's an increase in cost to the producer that would generally be pushed on to the consumer so it would follow suit that they would both follow a, a somewhat similar pattern okay so what are the causes of inflation so the first one off is when the um, Reserve Bank decides to lower interest rates, or should we say increase money supply, that actually increases demand for money. So more people demand money, and in fact they'll be borrowing money. So there'll be more borrowing, or it could be less savings. Either way, that results in more purchases being made. And if more purchases are being made, that is more demand on goods. And that's basically more competition amongst people and also firms as well are able to charge more because there's more people trying to buy their goods and that actually pushes prices up given that extra demand. So you can look at it in terms of investment. I think that's typically in economics. You look at textbooks, you relate investment to interest rates. You have lower interest rates, means you can buy machinery and capital and land and all of that for production purposes. Some may argue, and I think a lot of economists argue, that interest rates don't have that much of an impact on investment, but it's more the investment opportunities that actually drive investment. It's based on what those returns are coming in, rather than necessarily the costs that are going out that drives investment. So as I mentioned before, interest rates can actually affect consumption. So people may be, may be more willing to use their credit cards if, for example, the repayments, say, I don't know, it drops, let's say, you're going down from 16% to maybe 10% on you. So it feels like you can borrow more money because you've got less repayments. So you'd be paying less back because you've got uh, a lower interest rate and that drives consumption. And once consumption is increasing, that actually pushes prices up. And that is not talked about as much in economics as investment, but I found it, that there's a, quite a relationship between the two. All right, so... You can see from this graph, there seems to be quite a strong correlation between money growth. It's got their uh, M2, it's a type of money, which includes coins and notes and checks and things like that, and a relationship to inflation. So that is quite well correlated. Doesn't seem to be an awful lot of lags in there. I think that's uh, US data. What is it going back? Oh, it goes back a oh, very long time. There's actually quite a lot of data in there indicating that there's quite a strong relationship between money supply and inflation. So, when we talk about money supply, what actually is money supply and how is it created? So imagine you've got a central bank and they loan out $100 to a bank, just a regular bank. So a central bank, by the way, is the bank that controls or creates all the money, should we say. 
and the other banks are just the more commercial banks that basically that you, you and I deal with. So anyway, so they have their hundred dollars. So you'll have what we call a reserve ratio. So that could be in this case, I think it's ten percent or one over ten. So in other words, they've got to keep ten of every hundred dollars they receive, or one dollar out of ten dollars received. So in this case, they've got a hundred dollars. Ten needs to stay in reserve, and they can actually loan out the remaining ninety. And then that ninety then will go to another bank or another individual, and then they can then save that money. So as an individual can put it into the bank, and then the bank can then loan out that. Um, Again, that would be 90%, so save 10%, so that would be $81 to someone else or to another bank, and then it goes on and on and so forth. So that's what we call uh, creation of money. So we may have only started initially with $100, but that can actually blow out to a much higher figure. So you can see here from this table, so we started with loaning out of the bank, central bank was 100, and then they loaned out 90, then to 81, then 70, and so on, and also each bank is also holding the amount in reserve. So eventually, you'll have 100 in reserve, but the amount of money actually created, well, at 10% anyway, actually amounts to $1,000 and not 100. So that's actually quite a massive amount of money that's coming into the economy based on just what seems fairly small, 10 times the amount, actually. And that all depends as well on your reserve ratio. You, the smaller your reserve ratio, so if it dropped from 10% down to 5%, so then you'd have 95% each time going out, and that would push the amount of total money created by quite a bit. And that can actually have quite an effect on inflation as you have that extra money being pumped into the economy. So that's potentially that can weaken your currency in the sense that, well, reduce your purchasing power, should I say. And also, yeah, uh, a little bit later. Um, so what else do you have? You also got cost push inflation. So this, I wouldn't say it's uncommon. I think it's less common than some of the other causes, given that I think costs are generally going down with better technology. But there's a possibility you can still have higher costs in certain sectors, especially where you may have high wage increases, for example. Or there could be shortages in particular. Uh, inputs or raw materials so you may not be able to acquire them as easily especially if there's a high demand and that's pushing your costs up and the higher costs then get passed on to the consumer us the consumers and then we pay more and that's where your prices are going up and you've got your inflation also um, it could be simply the money supply is being kept constant but there's greater demand so that could be for any number of reasons like for example we could be any higher incomes or People have got a higher propensity to consume than they did before. So people are actually going out and spending more money. Or it could be because there's great sentiments, investment sentiments out there to increase demand. Or it could even be government expenditure. The government may be spending a lot more money now or giving a push to the economy. And as the economy gets closer and closer to full employment, you realize that the pressure on prices is actually greater and greater. So as you can see here, you'll have a situation where you have your nominal GDP going up because of uh, the pressure on prices. You may also have a real GDP, which is the actual output. So the difference between nominal GDP and real GDP is that nominal GDP includes your increases in prices and not just output, whereas your real GDP only includes your output increase and not because of the increase in price. So for an increase in GDP, for example, you'd have an output of, let's say, 100 and then you'd have an output, let's say 110, 120. That would be an increase in real GDP. Whereas in nominal GDP, you may have the same output of 100. Output could be 100 in both cases. But because you've got a higher price, then the nominal GDP is going to be higher because that 100 multiplied by well, whatever the new price is, is going to push those prices up. That is what we call a, a demand pull inflation. Okay, uh, another one we've got here. And this relates to imports and relates to exchange rates. As you can see, there's an inverse relationship between exchange rates and inflation. So as your currency gets weaker, inflation tends to go up, as you can see from the graph. And you see that there might be a slight lag in that, but they uh, follow fairly closely. And that's because if your currency is weaker, you need to import, if it's like import uh, raw materials or import from any other sort of goods from another country, if the currency is weaker, you'll have to pay more money for that. And that is actually going to push your prices up. So that gives you a disadvantage as well, in the sense that um, 
your, your currency is worth less, so therefore you're going to have to spend and do more in order to acquire stuff. But there's also some argue that there's a good side to having a lower exchange rate as well, because that makes your exports more competitive, so people will be buying their exports more as well. And as you can see from China, they've kept their exchange rate fairly low and their exports have been very competitive because of that. So what I'm going to go on to now is hyperinflation. And that is the most dangerous form of inflation in the sense that that's when prices basically just go completely out of whack. And that could be because of some of the reasons I mentioned earlier. But often the case though with hyperinflation, it relates to actual confidence in a particular currency. Now we've seen that with countries like Zimbabwe and um, Venezuela, as you can see from this diagram back in the 1920s with Germany, where prices just go completely out of whack because there's no current confidence in the currency, no one wants to buy up the currency, no one wants to hold the currency. So, and, and unfortunately when it gets to that point, it's a complete erosion of um, wealth in the sense that you may have saved up for years and years and years and affects your money may not be actually worth anything compared to what it was previously in the sense that you know you've earned all your money up to this point with an expectation prices would be at a certain level and hyperinflation comes in and everything's completely eroded. If you just got moderate inflation, you, your savings are still eroded but to a lesser extent and you've also got interest rates or pay money back to you. So you save money in, put money in your bank account, your money increases through the interest rates, though the value is lower because of inflation. So that will give you a real interest rate should be saying the real interest rate should still be greater than zero so in fact your money is still going to be worth something because you're getting money back in return all right uh what i want to talk about now is going back on something i talked about in a previous video is uh, unemployment and this is talking about the relationship between inflation and unemployment and what we have here is what we call a phillips curve so generally there's an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation so if you've got very high unemployment, you generally have fairly low inflation. So in a sense, that, that's a point the economy is. It's got a lot of people out of jobs and all that. They don't have money to go out and buy things. So generally, you're not going to see prices go up through demand purposes. But a Phillips curve doesn't always work out, especially if you have something known as stagflation. And that could be a situation where it's not so much a demand problem, it's, it's a massive supply problem. So you have unemployment and also you have inflation as well because of the shortages that people ha are still have to compete with each other to buy things. And that is another way of looking at it. And actually you'd see a shift in your Phillips curve under those um, circumstances. All right, well that takes me to the uh, end of this video. Um, if you liked it, click the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, uh, remember to hit the subscribe button. I have a number of other macro videos. I've got... Um, Oh, I've got the basic introduction to macro and I've also got one on unemployment as well you might want to see. Uh, but I focus more on microeconomics generally and looking at things like demand and supply, the micro side of it, looking at uh, game theory, looking at cost benefit analysis. And also uh, I'm currently writing a book called Vegan Economics and I've got a number of uh, videos coming out on that as well. So if any of that stuff interests you, please hit the subscribe button. And I also think there's a little bell on there as well. You can hit that, it'll give you a reminder when the videos come out. I normally put up about two videos a week uh, with some of the work coming up, I may have to reduce that to one video, but it's normally Mondays and Fridays are the day for my video. But anyway, thank you for watching and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon.